Hey, what's up? This is Trey Pierce, audio engineer, digital director, director of financial planning and analysis, senior creative director of AR, program director, morning show host, and you're listening to the Springboard. 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 Springboard Music Podcast. I am so excited to share this interview with you guys that we had with the wonderful Greg Ham. He brought so much wisdom and really carried our mission for helping the next generation of music industry professionals. So without further ado, here's Greg Ham. So I'm really grateful to have you on here. I was awesome. reading your bio and it's like, do you say yes to everything? <laughs> Interesting <laughs> enough, there's been years where that was my motto. Yes. What is your question? So well, I just put that in life as a general purpose. I would just say, yes, what is your question? And, that's amazing. And then there's years where you have to say, no, let me think about it. Because you can't say yes to everything. But I do have a tendency to be more accessible than not as a general rule. Um, have you seen benefits from that rule or are there some caveats to it? Like when... What's kind of your guideline for saying yes? So I'll just give an anecdotal kind of approach. I start my day most mornings at breakfast uh, at First Watch. Back in the day, it was Cracker Barrel. Um, and so I would normally have one or a double breakfast at the same location. So two meetings before I get to the office. And then when I get to the office, I do very little lunch. So when I'm here, I'm here. And at the same time, a lot of my career, I traveled quite a bit. Uh, so I believe relationships are the key to why something moves forward. Uh, I think it's know-how. I think there's a lot of parts that make up the chair. Relational part of that's important to me. And so, and also paying it forward. So a lot of times I'll get someone who'll say, hey, can I pick your brain? And I'm normally, my normal line is it's slim pickings, but if you would like to, you're more than welcome. <laughs> so um, it's just that kind of thing. So I've met with a ton of people and it's, it's as much meeting with them for them, but it's meeting for them and then realizing, wow, that might've been for me. Hmm. You know, it's a lot of times in life, somebody says, can you help me with this? And as you're helping or as you're listening, you're realizing what they're in the middle of might be something that applies to you. And so I think being always a learner, even when someone's coming to you for an answer, there's a learning opportunity for you in that. And so I think just being aware, um, there's a lot of people that I've met with, artists over the years I didn't manage, but they were like, hey, is there any way you could weigh in on this? And I have, and it's not always been for a monetary gain. It's been because it just felt like the right thing to do. I did it. And they kept moving forward and I kept moving forward and we didn't do anything else. I just think it happens through that. So somebody said, I didn't know you know people from this company. And I was like, that's because I'm old. I go way back. You know, this is a long, if in some ways it feels like three careers. Um, and I've had three mentors. So that's why I don't mind taking that meeting with someone I don't know, especially if someone was to say, if Velvet was to call me and say, Greg, any chance you can meet with this person? My answer would be yes, because I have deep relationship with Zach and Bell for a long time. Uh, so that would be enough for me. If they're asking me, I don't need to know more. Well, thank you, because that's how we yeah. got connected. So yeah. I'm so grateful. Um, and I've personally benefited from that. And I can't wait to continue to benefit from this discussion. You mentioned that it feels like you've had three careers. Um, I want to play a little game, one question of right. fact or fiction, because I've heard a rumor about you and I'm going to just lay it to bed right now. Is it true that you used to be a UPS driver? Not a UPS driver, but it is true. I worked five years at UPS. Okay. So, so fact and fiction. I like the twist. <laughs> It's the twist. So I never drove. I was in preload. So I loaded the truck for the guy who drove. And uh, that's a hard job. Trucks. It was, uh, and I did it from part of that time. So this is while I'm in school. 
in Nashville, mid eighties, um, working at UPS from 11 at night till four in the morning, part of the time. And from three in the morning to eight in the morning, part of the time. And then at Christmas time from 11 at night till eight in the morning and going to school and then and married. So you got to think I was, we just celebrated 37 years married. Pam and I. Congratulations. Yeah. So it's a great, uh, so we were children ourselves and we were married away from home. So it just, everything plays together. I don't think anything is for not. I think we, we all have um, intersections. I, I use that term a lot. And to me, UPS was an intersection that provided us health insurance, provided us income, and allowed me to have daylight hours to be at school, to be with her when she got off work, and then go back to sleep before I would go back and do it again. So That's such a strategic job. It says a lot about how you think and how you plan just in that one decision too. Um, I'm curious, you said that you guys were away from home here in Nashville. So did you come to Nashville knowing you wanted to be involved in music? I did not. So I came to Nashville in 1984 uh, to a college called Welch College, which is over on, used to be on West End Avenue in the historical section, now is out north of town in Hendersonville. And it was more a Bible school, uh, denominational type school. I thought I was going to do something in full-time Christian work, but it's a very conservative upbringing that I had. So that meant, do you want to be a pastor, a missionary, or a teacher? And I thought, well, I don't want to be any of the above. Can I take D, none of the above? But I still feel like God's called me to something more. And so I got here and my Christian worldview kind of just opened. So I started seeing how music was used in ministry. And I would say that was the draw to me. Uh, so my degree is in administration and theology because uh, everybody got a theology degree who went to school. <laughs> so I'm thankful for that. Four years, double BA. I mean, you know, double major and a BA. And yet. I use it every day, and in some ways, I'd say I've never used it, right? It's both and. So in the 80s, that was really the beginning of Christ, of the Christian music era. So you've seen it completely evolve. It was the the flourishing of the era. So it yes. started, and, you know, really when you think about it, started in the 70s, and we did the Jesus doc uh, that we did last year that I got a great privilege to be part of. and. Even some things in doing that, you learn things that you were part of and things that were ahead of you. Uh, and yet you see all those stepping stones that got us to where we are today and where this industry is. Um, my wife was really the first one probably in the early 80s. I grew up and my mom was in a Southern Gospel group uh, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, they no made two records. They toured all over the state of Florida and into the surrounding four or five states. They had a tour bus, but I would have never thought I was in the music industry. I thought that was just that was just a, something they did for those years when I was very young. As it got later, and then as this thing formalized in the more late eighties, I was like, I guess I have been in the music industry. Because we would be on the road, we'd leave on a Friday, come back on an early Monday morning, everybody would work, my family would work, but we would be then doing ministry on the weekend via music. Oh my goodness. So you grew up around, you know, before it was really classified as the music industry, you grew up in it. Uh, well, the Southern Gospel thing was already happening, but yes, they were a Southern Gospel trio, her and her two sisters. Uh, my dad and my uncle drove the bus. We had a tour bus that we had converted from an old bus. So it's not as glamorous as it sounds. Let me <laughs> assure you. It was like a it city bus isn't. that we got creative. You would have thought, not even the Partridge family level. It was below that, you know. So, <laughs> but it was great. And ministry was happening. And I remember moments, even when I was six, seven, ten years old, of watching my mom and her sisters up there. and. And truly watch, like, God work in a room via this vehicle of music. 
And I think that stuck, even though it stuck with me, it wasn't leading like, that's what I want to do. But when I started doing it, I was reminded. That's probably how I would say it. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. The hindsight kind of gave you that. It When you started leaning into it, you got that nostalgic feeling and it connected all Absolutely. the dots for you in a way. So yeah. you're driving, you're not driving. We put that rumor to bed. Uh, <laughs> you're working, you're loading the trucks for UPS. You're married, you're finishing school. How do you get connected with Forefront? So I had a cousin and his wife that both work for Brock and Associates, uh, which managed DeGarmo and Key. So Eddie DeGarmo and Dana Key were a duo, a rock band. And this management company managed them. And there was this little, again, intersection. We were out where the highway splits at 170 uh, in Nashville, you know, just between Bellmead and Bellevue. And there was, used to be a Baskin Robbins sitting there. And we were out there having ice cream one night. And they said, hey, we need, some, we need somebody to um, work in the mail room. And they'll pay X. And I said, tell them to pay me one and a half times that. I'll work twice as hard and save them half. That was genius. <laughs> and they said I yes? Was just to be clear, I was just popping off. I, I did not have any intention of doing it. I was just, it just came to me. I said it. And then Dan Brock's wife, Darlene Brock said, Hey, have him come in. I want to chat with him. And so I went in and we chatted and she said, yeah, we'll pay you what you're asking. And here's how we would want you to work part time. That was in the fall. I'm a, I guess 88 fall of 88. And then top of 89, I guess it was, uh, was when I took a full-time job there. I quit UPS. I finished my five years, stayed through my five-year bonus. That's why I was in preload because it paid more if you did preload versus unload. So I thought, they said, if you learn these addresses, then you'd make this much more. I was like, I'll learn them by tomorrow. So, That's amazing. You're yeah. so driven. And I know you have to be to do what you do. And when I was reading your bio, this is crazy. So you started part-time in the mailroom at Forefront. That is and correct. you became the president within like nine, nine and a half years. About nine years. That's about right. Nine and a half years. That's, that's correct. That's so fast. Did you feel like those nine years equipped you to do that? Or was it something that just fell into your lap? I feel like the previous 10 years had equipped me to do that. So I, that's when I said three, my, I had three mentors in my life. So my dad was a mentor. We grew up in a family business, automotive tire business, nothing to do with music other than albums and CDs are round and tires are round. But other than that, there was no <laughs> correlation. Um, but it was business. It, I understood selling. I understood relationship. I understood certain base principles from my dad, common sense, work ethic, things that apply to everything anybody does. Uh, at the end of the day, I think we're all in sales, right? We're all selling something. Um, and so it's how you sell, how you uh, take care of people, customer service, you know, put all that together. That was that original, what I would call base. And then Dan Brock was my corporate man. I mean, was my independent mentor in the music business, my first person. And because they were so involved in the management company, we were starting a label in the kitchen of that management company called Forefront Records. So I was about the third employee hired, uh, did everything. And because they were so involved in the management side and Eddie was on the road, Eddie and Dana were on the road. Ron Griffin was the president of the, label but really producer and then dan brock was managing the acts because that's where the revenue was coming in this is a brand new startup i got thrown into the middle so my first sales conference that i went to and attended was the first sales conference i presented at i'd never been to one do you feel like looking back that presentation was on par with what was expected of you because that would be my biggest fear <laughs> Nobody had given me even what I was going to be at. So I just did me. 
right? Yeah. And, people, and I connected with people and I knew the artists that I was presenting and I went in and presented and met the people along the way. So I, it was kind of by that track record, I feel like those two eras really prepared me for late 98, early 99 in taking over Forefront when Dan and Eddie stepped down. So the company sold in spring of, or in summer of 96. Every, the three of us signed, you know, on to be part of corporate, part of EMI at that time. Now, Universal or Capital Christian. Uh, but it was through that era that they then decided to exit. Bill Hearn would have been my third mentor. Uh, who was my corporate mentor and uh i miss him to this day i think our industry misses him to this day because he truly played whole pie ball not just his part of the pie ball and when you grow the whole pie then your portion of it will grow and when you just focus on your part it might shrink because the whole business isn't growing so he in my opinion was one of the few in when we look at history that truly looked at the whole pie. I had the privilege of working under Bill Hearn for, I believe, seven months. Mm-hmm. Um, and even in those seven months, you could feel his um his strategy, his uh his methodology, his methodology, mm-hmm. you can, you could feel, um, his priorities. Mm-hmm. It was, it was tangible in the company. Um, so I completely agree with you. I think the industry massively misses Bill Hearn. What a privilege that you got to have him as a, a mentor. It was absolutely fantastic. So, you know, you got to think where we were as an industry. So when I took over Forefront, we had two of the best years not, not that I was there, but that we're already set up to be two of the best years, right? And then we hit 2001, which Napster hit 99. The business starts changing in 2000. By 2001, we're seeing a decline. And I, again, I will lean to Bill's leadership that we got ahead of that. And then that's when it became EMI, Christian Music Group, or, or the label group versus Forefront and Sparrow, though those brands still were there. They all that back office got collapsed in the one umbrella. Now, it was the thing to me that really set us to be where they are today because we got ahead of not trying to keep duplicates, but where can we save? Where can it, where can we weather this at? And it's not if storms come, it's when storms come in life, in business, everything. So it's like how we prepare now is how we weather that. And I feel like Bill led us to a point. There was a small executive team that we got together and we had to make hard decisions. You know, you're talking about lives, you're talking about letting people go, about shrinking things to navigate this next season. And it's hard in one sense, but needed. And most leaders don't act quick enough or cut deep enough to weather. And then you're, you know, it's always a hard thing. And at the end of the day, not to make it sound trite, but like when we had to cut people, that was hard. And yet I'm not God. So it's like, I'm not in charge of those people at that level. I'm in charge of those people for what we've been entrusted with. And the business was changing. And so I can look back and see so many of those folks that are still some of my dearest friends that did not have a job once we got into the mid 2000s with us and yet they have done great things because you know again they're gods they're not we we are entrusted for a season we can't play god i think that's so wise i've never heard it described exactly like that but the way you just described it makes complete sense and i think that there's freedom in god's sovereignty Mm. And an expectation of his faithfulness in that process as well. Um, You mentioned the Napster era, and Mm. some of our listeners are a little too young to remember what that is. Do you mind giving just a brief history lesson on 
that 2000, 2001 Napster era? I mean, it just changed our business. It's as uh, the consumer, the consumer was ready to consume differently. And as an industry, we wanted to keep what we had intact. And so that was our on-ramp into the super highway of music being downloaded for a season, music being streamed now, and everything was built throughout, you think the whole 90s and really late 80s to mid 90s was really all around a piece of plastic that the music was carried on. Ultimately, what people were buying was music. I think as an industry, just just an opinion, I'm not I'm not speaking for the industry, I'm speaking for Greg Ham. We got fixated on this piece of plastic and maybe lost sight of the music a little bit. And it was because that's how the model was built. The revenue was built on selling 12 songs or 14 songs every time. And then we get into this digital age. And I would just say, again, I'll go on record and say that I think as an industry, we didn't do some things correctly that we have to own. And instead of embracing the narrative, we tried to defend our narrative, even though the consumer was saying, no, I really just want to buy two songs. Or I really just want to buy 2.3 songs is about what they were saying per record, if we want to be exact. And, and instead of helping them do that, we kept saying, no, we sell 12 songs at a time. And I think we could have had more. And hindsight is always 2020 when you look back and you're like, oh man, if we would have just, if we would have. I think we got a little caught in our own head as leadership of the industry. And I think we could have uh, gone at it a little more, um, again, steered the narrative and help people consume the way they want to consume, which we are now, look at it. I mean, it, but it was via being forced to, not necessarily being willing, which might have changed that 12 years of decline a little bit. So if really yeah. from 2001 till about, well, I, I won't get, don't quote me for factual, but I'll <laughs> uh, roughly say from 2001 to 2012 or 13, we kept a decline and found bottom and then now we're on this increase, almost like a hockey stick. But when you add inflation in there and go, I mean, you can look this up at RIAA, um, Recording Industry Association of America. You'll see that when you add inflation in there, we're still a bit behind. We're almost eclipsed. But when you add inflation in, we're still a great percentage behind where we were in 2001. One of the missing pieces of the music industry history or missing connections is mm -hmm. Spotify, Apple Music, all of those things were the music industry solution to what was happening with Napster and with, you know, downloading through the MP3 converter. Um, guilty, sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> like, because the consumer, like you said, they were saying, we want to do this differently. And mm -hmm. without their literal buy-in, there's nothing. Um, and, you know, the quicker you can evolve and adapt, the less pain you're going to endure. But like you said, hindsight's twenty twenty, and now we can learn and see what's coming on the front end now and start to adapt a little quicker. At the end of the day, I, I don't think you can go back. You can't change. That's what I love about, I love history. And history is what happened and we can learn from it. But our past successes, even our past failures, won't take us to the future. So I can say I was part of this. I did this. I did this. And that's all good. It's canonized. We can look back on it and we can learn from it. It is does not really apply to right now or forward. It, other than the learning from it, because we can't relive that. Yeah, there's so many different factors. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned inflation. That's a huge factor that's just going to make our decisions different because things mm -hmm. cost more or they don't bring the same revenue or people are consuming differently or holding back from certain things. And I would say this era or this time we've been in, we've, even though more music's being consumed, it's not as, um, what's the word? 
experiential sometimes. So you, you, you look at the golden age of music, 70s, 80s, really 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, where people were, cons they would listen to an album. It was about an album. And now it's about a song. And it might be about a song in the background while I'm playing a game, while I'm watching a show, while I'm doing my work. So it could be almost a more passive experience. I'm happy to be part of the experience, period. You know, you'd love that we can get people back to that point of feeling it, you know, and music. I believe in music. I'm bullish. Even in our downturn, I was like, I'm not chicken little skies falling. Are we going to, is the industry going to be the same? I don't know. But music's not going away. Music's too powerful. Uh, I believe, and again, you have to fact check me, but Plato said, give me the music of a nation and I'll change the nation. That's the Greg Ham paraphrase. You probably didn't say it <laughs> specifically that way. It's but probably better think though. Scripturally, think about scripturally though. The day Jesus came riding into the city in Holy Week, it was to music. Oh my gosh, when, even David's time. When they would go into battle, it was to music. I mean, think of in Daniel or in yeah, David going and playing for to console. But then you think when Jesus comes back again, it will be to music. And yeah. if you go all the way to Revelation 14, it says we will sing a new song before the throne. If you're in music, that should be encouraging. We know music is here till the end. Hey, and thanks for listening to us today. I'm Rachel Hessian, your host of the Springboard Music Podcast. I love that interview. One thing that I love what Greg Ham says in this interview is even when somebody is coming to you for an answer, there's a learning opportunity for you. Knowing all that Greg has accomplished in his life and the experiences he's had, that is such a telling sign of humility. So how much more true is that for you or for me? I love that. When somebody's coming to me for an answer, how can I find a way to be enriched in that discussion? It's a great challenge and one that I hope you'll chew on for a minute today.